except that I hope that those who seek to derail our work in being constructive in EU-Iran relations and those who uh, would not like to see the delegation visit uh, go through will not succeed. Uh, I think we should not allow hardliners to destroy the momentum uh, of hope and opportunity and we must take our responsibility in doing what we can within our values and our principles and our position uh, to make sure that, that this opportunity is, is seized. Uh, also, in terms of full disclosure and transparency, I just wanted to let you know that I'm a board member of the Iran Human Rights Documentation Center, uh, of which one of the speakers will participate. She's entirely free to say uh, what she will say, but I wanted you to know that I have involved with that center. Uh, she will join by a video connection later, as she's So, uh, with that, uh, again, welcome. I look forward to uh, our discussions. I'm very grateful that you're spending your afternoon with us. And now, I'd like to give the floor to Tarya from the Green Group and the Chairwoman of the Iran delegation. Thank you very much, Maritia. Maritia is hosting this meeting together with some of you, and I promised I would, I would say just a few of your words about the situation in Iran, although I must say that after a couple of weeks, we are wiser and would actually know more about the situation. But uh, comment the situation and also maybe first of all tell you something about the delegation relations with Iran within EU the Parliament. The mandate of the delegation is to have a dialogue with the Parliament in Iran. And, and so it's an inter-parliamentary dialogue where the idea is that the delegation will bring back knowledge <laughs> about Iran, what is going on, to the work of the Parliament. So it's and it's a two-way street. We visit the Parliament and the Parliament in, uh, in Iran will visit us. Now, because of the isolation of Iran, this connection has been uh, not working for, I think it is almost six years when there was last contact and we have been trying to, to go there. There have been many reasons why it has not succeeded, but as Marita Skalke was saying, this is the time of hope and I, I certainly hope that next week when we are we're taking off to Tehran with the delegation, from the delegation, then it will be successful. On the, on the question of why now and, and uh, what is the situation, the situation of course has changed. Like it was said that, that it's the people of Iran who have elected a, a new president, there's a new government, there's a foreign minister who is very open to the West and contacts with the West. So in this situation, there was the possibility of, of a deal on the nuclear issue, and I, I'm sure that you know, know uh, many details about this uh, deal, but I, I want to stress a few things. First of all, it's the first step. So this is not a, a, a final deal, it's kind of a confidence-creating measure where you actually actually have a chance to see whether, whether both parties, the E3 plus 3, and Iran take this seriously. So uh, it's a way to show now that both are serious and, and we want to finally close the deal. There will be ongoing negotiations all, all the time, and there are, of course, many pitfalls. There are many who are opposed to this deal, and, and, and so the next six months will show how the, how the final process will uh, look. Iran has agreed to freeze uh, its nuclear program and uh, under very close contact actually daily by the International Atomic Energy Agency. So this is uh, the one side of the deal. The second side is of course the question of sanctions. And I, I am sure that you're familiar. I'll just comment a few things on the sanctions. First of all, uh, this is not a major uh, relief to the giant sanctions. It is said that it's only very limited, and it is very limited. It is also reverse, reversal, so the sanctions can be uh, put back in place in a very short time, should there uh, be some, some uh, problems with the deal on both sides. And it will deal with uh, certain things such as automotive parts, petrochemicals, some metals, gold, and I think the most positive part in, in this sanction is for us who are actually interacting with the Iranian people that actually there will be a special channel for 
medical uh, medical um, uh, things. The, the medical supplies have been exempt from sanctions from before, but there has been a problem on the practical carrying out of, of, of this uh, buying medicine. So this will be helped now. There will be a special channel. And also foreigners, uh, Iranian students who are studying abroad will be able to to have monetary transactions for the for the livelihood. And and uh, of course then the oil sanctions, the uh, financial transactions, they are still in place and and uh, only the six months will tell what will be the end result in this case. But there is the political will. I, I would like to underline this, that there is this political will which is now present. There is a uh, first step, there is confidence building measures and also the end state has been discussed in, in the negotiations. And at this time, uh, we as a delegation for Iran want to broaden the, the scope of, of the agenda. When we go to Iran in, in uh, next week, we will also take up discussion on human rights. The Iranians have already uh, indicated that they are willing to carry out the dialogue on human rights. This is not only in the parliament, but also, also with the NGOs. Uh, there will be discussions about uh, drug trade, which is very important for Europe. There, there are issues related to the Middle East, the neighbors, the foreign, foreign policy of Iran, which actually is changing, I think, the, Foreign Minister is right now in a, in a travel around, around the Gulf and has indicated that uh, the neighbors are the priority. So there are a lot of changes and I think the Middle East is actually changing a lot. So this is time for discussions and this is time for opening up for the society and hopefully we will be able to carry out a very constructive dialogue with the Iranian parliament and and other organizations while they are. Something has changed. The window has opened. Like a deflection point on a curve, the point right after and right before are not that different from the vantage point of the coordinates, but the direction has changed. And this is always important on regimes based on ideology, because on ideology, these are absolute. And once there is a little bit of crashing, there is an opening. A struggle is going on in Iran between those who are pro opening and those against those who are pro opening should be helped. The struggle will eventually involve a massive shift of power from a group to another. So it's not going to go without a big struggle and a big fight. We are here to discuss how this opening, this little opening in the door, could be pushed further in the interest of more freedom uh, and a broader give and take between Iran and the free world in the interest of all. Parliamentary trip to Iran is a watershed event if it takes place this time. Yeah. And uh, as uh, a distinguished former parliamentarian, Mr. Mansoui, who's here, he could, uh, and I hope he'll participate in this, he could say how important making an impression on the parliament can be. I will not belabor the point much. We will go into the panel discussion. There are much smarter people than me who will be addressing this issue. But the important point, I think, is to impress the parliamentarians and whoever you see that the problems, which is principally the economic problems that have brought Iran to the table and caused this inflection point, are not going to be solved by one or two meetings, one temporary or even one permanent agreement, but will only be solved by increased contact across a broad range of civil of economic interactions. And those are not going to come to pass without certain reforms that give confidence to, even if it's just the private sector, 
even if it's just for economic relations, that would give confidence that they're embarking, embarking on a road whose rewards are higher than its risks. It is the core of the problem that the Islamic Republic of Iran has very little respect for the rights of its citizens. And I think it will affect all aspects of life, including trade and other relations with foreign countries. From the beginning of the revolution, a very serious and concerted attack was made on the judiciary. All the experienced judges were somehow purged or retired or sent home or found reasons not to let them carry on. Women judges were summarily terminated as the, their services. And then they attacked the Bar Association. In the first year of the revolution, they hired 1,000 judges from the Islamic seminaries who had no experience in Iranian law, who had no background of practicing as judges or even lawyers. And they came and took over the judiciary in Iran. The only criteria for appointing them was their total loyalty to the regime. The judiciary had become the instrument of repression and control by the Islamic Republic of Iran and remains the biggest problem of Iran, both for the citizens of Iran that had suffered so terribly in the hands of this judiciary, and also for the business relationship. 34 years of culture of impunity had created a situation in Iran that everything goes. The head of judiciary, when he was accused of stealing money, comes and openly states that, yes, I have taken all the money that was deposited with the courts to my personal account and used it to earn more money and pay other expenses, and now I have put it back. This is the head of judiciary of the country. The person who was involved in the murders of thousands of people in 1988 is now the Minister of Justice. Unless we address the issue of human rights and the rights of Iranian citizens and problems of judiciary, Iran's problems would not finish. So I think item number one on any agenda of the European negotiating team would be the reform of judiciary in Iran. That would be the most important thing. We had a major case in the course of the last two years with Iran. And the only defense that the Iranian government had in that case was there is corruption. So in order to prove that, they set up a phony trial in Tehran, accusing not only my client, who is not Iranian, he's a uh, Middle Eastern national, and his company of corruption, but bringing the Minister of Petroleum, former Minister of Petroleum, former head of NRC, <coughs> head of uh, marketing, all these things as accused to the court, and in order to succeed in the arbitration, brought the trial forward and issued a judgment against both. And they brought that to the arbitration. Lo and behold, there was a change of administration. The persons who were accused of all this corruption, now Mr. Zangin is the Minister of Petroleum, Mr. Jabodi is back as the Managing Director of NIC, and the regime doesn't know what to do with the judgment that it has falsely created. The, the problem with judiciary affects all aspects of life in Iran. And it has to be addressed for the best part of it. I think if the European Commission starts the dialogue on the issue of human rights and judiciary as a first step to normalization of the relationship and explaining that any trade with Iran 
protection of Iranian court, the protection of the judicial system that is safe and sound and not so much involved in corruption. There is not a single case in Iranian court that can be resolved without corruption. And that's even at the smallest level. Even the cases that have no political aspect in it, it cannot be resolved without properly corrupting the judge. And nobody for the last 35 years have been brought to the book by the judiciary or anybody from the judiciary for all the actions they have made or the misdeeds that they have carried out and misjudgments. And it is this culture of impunity because of the weakness or ineffectiveness of the judiciary that has created this problem. I myself have been in Tehran on three or four occasions. In, uh, I don't remember exactly, 2001, 2003, 2004, but I've been there. It has been very interesting to go there. <coughs> it has been very interesting to see also the compound of the U.S. Embassy in the center of Tehran. And I hope that time will come now for the Iranian people, what, regardless of much other than that, they will clean up this site in the sense that the, the connections between the two countries, Iran, Iran and the U.S., will be restored and this building will take its former nicer shape. It's a shame to the center of Tehran needing to see that. And I remember in 2001 or 2003, I went around that uh, compound and saw what had happened <clears throat> or the effects. When I discussed Iran, and that's my uh, main message today, is the need for an agreement regarding uh, international arbitration involving Tehran. And that's my bottom line. I remember when I was discussing this in 2001 up to 2004, I was told by an eminent uh, Iranian diplomat, this will happen when time is right. When the apple is right, it will fall down and we will have this agreement on arbitration. Of course, it was not right at that time. Is it right today? I wonder. I hope. Let's see. Maybe the European delegation will go with that next week and open up doors and continue this dialogue. My view in general about the arbitration agreement, taking it from the end of my speech, bringing it forward for you to hopefully remember, is that an arbitration agreement is, in my thinking, not a very difficult diplomatic act. It's only there to ensure that trade functions. It's only there to see that people dare to enter into trade agreements and that they are not caught in a system which doesn't work. But you can say that this, the judiciary system, but it's not that, because we have all over the world arbitration agreements. And we have the famous New York Convention, the New York Convention, which Iran has uh, signed and is a member of, which is very important. But the fact that Iran is a member of the Iranian, of the New York Convention, means that any award passed uh, in any country uh, between uh, countries where, uh, who are members of, of this uh, New York Convention, they can, these awards can be enforced. And that means that an award between an Iranian company and any, uh, most of the Euro all, all the European countries can be informed in any country who is a member of the New York Convention. And more than 120 countries are members of that uh, convention, which means that if an Iranian company does not pay, if an Iranian company loses the arbitration, the uh, one who 
succeeds in the arbitration proceedings can revert to assets that this Iranian company has in any country, any country that is a member of the New York Convention. And as you asked once again, there are so many countries, so mostly uh, you can find always assets uh, in relation to that. Um, I'm saying this, talking about this arbitration agreement, um, which I would favor that uh, Iran should, or its trade chamber of commerce should enter together with the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce, um, because that has been done before, and it has been very successful, and it has opened trade in between the countries that have made such agreements. This is an historic ex uh, experience. And the first one, which was the most important one here, was the agreement back in 1976 between the Chamber of Commerce in Moscow during the period of the Soviet Union and the Cold War. It was an agreement between the um, Moscow uh, Chamber of Commerce and the AAA, which is the American Arbitration Association in New York. And the third party to that agreement was the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce. And it was an agreement assured by the Stockholm Chamber of Commerce Arbitration Institute to see that this agreement between these two countries during the period of the Cold War functioned and that the disputes were solved there successfully. And I must say that uh, that was the case. A lot of Russian com companies came to Stockholm and, and um, to, to solve their disputes. And I think that both the uh, companies from Russia as well as those from the states uh, were happy or not as, as unhappy as they could have been about the outcome of, of these disputes. It was very, it's very important to see that an arbitration panel, the um, tribunal, if you like, composed by three members, uh, where each side chooses one member. And in this case, I'm speaking about the board of the Stockholm Arbitration Center chooses the chairman. That there is a well-balanced award and um, that um, you listen to the parties in a, in a good manner and balance that's the outcome of the board. You should not change the outcome uh, due to any political caretaking. Uh, but it is important that those parties that rely on, the, on this tribunal also feel that the outcome is at least sufficient. 